Good morning and welcome to those that are present this morning to our morning worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. For those visiting, we're certainly glad you've decided to be with us. We would ask each to take just a moment, fill out an attendance card, pass that to the center aisle. We'll pick that up at the close of our service so that we may have a record of your visit here with us today. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings. Brother Johnny McDaniel, let's select a number two is our first song, number two. Brother Derek Duffy will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. Sidney White will bring us a message of the hour. And David Wilson will conclude our service in prayer this morning. Those on our prayer list, we wish to bring to your attention how cash is to have eye surgery this coming week, Thursday, May the 7th. Mary Blanks, a former member here, we understand is at the hospital in Carrollton, Tanner Medical Center in Carrollton. We do not have a room number. Carrie Wilson asked prayer for two members of her family. Her grandfather, Mr. Clifford Troop, is to have upcoming tests at the hospital in Huntsville, Alabama. And also her mother, Brenda, is still struggling with some health difficulties. You're asked to keep these in your prayer. Also, this coming Saturday is a big day in the Nolan household. Brother Jimmy's youngest daughter, Chelsea, is getting married to Austin. That will be this coming Saturday, May the 9th, on the campus of Harding University. And also, the graduation of uh, Amanda is also coming up the same day, so congratulations to them. Certainly, we need to be mindful of them traveling also, Ken and Phyllis as well. Other events I want to bring to your attention, the Brothers Keepers Group Number 1 will meet this coming Friday, May the 8th, at the home of Eloise Bell. Bring a potluck dish for dinner and no more than $4 for a non-perishable item for a care package for that assembly. It was originally scheduled for 6 p.m., but it's been changed to 7. Again, that's Brothers Keepers Group 1 this coming Friday, May, May the 8th at 7 p.m. at the home of Eloise Bell. Brothers Keepers Group number two will meet this coming Saturday, May the 9th, at the home of Sue Worley. Uh, weather permitting, we'll grill outside. If not, if uh, Mother Nature spoils that, we'll meet at the house next door. This afternoon, CIA will meet at 4.30. Also, there's a gospel meeting that begins today at the Villa Rica congregation. Brother Winford Claiborne, no stranger to us here at Bremen, is conducting that meeting. They will meet each evening at 7.30. So this evening at 7.30 through Thursday, 7.30, gospel meeting at Villa Rica with Brother Winford Claiborne speaking. Also, two weeks from today, there will be a gospel meeting that begins at Tallapoosa. Brother Caleb Campbell will conduct that meeting again beginning two weeks from today, May 17th through the 20th. And also on behalf of the eldership, let me thank you for all of the efforts that were put forth and the attendance and the potlucks and so forth for our gospel meeting, which was an outstanding success. And for those who participated in helping with the youth rally, we had over 100 people here yesterday. So thanks to Johnny and Melanie and for those who helped conduct the youth rally, which again was an outstanding success yesterday. Let's begin our service. Bow with me as I pray, please. Father, we're thankful for the rain, for the many blessings of life you've provided for us, for this opportunity we have to meet in this comfortable place today, to worship thee, we hope, in spirit and in truth. May you be pleased with our effort today. For those that lead us in a public fashion this morning, may they have a good remembrance of what they prepared to lead us in or to say. We're thankful for answered prayer that you've provided for us for the success in our gospel meeting, for the gospel as it was presented. By, with free course. We hope that each was edified and uplifted as a result. For the youth rally yesterday, we're thankful for the efforts that were put forth, and may it have everlasting benefit for those who participated. Be with us, Father, as we worship Thee this morning. Look down upon us in tender mercy and forgive us when we fail Thee so that we may stand pure and clean and our worship will be acceptable. Continue to be with us, Father, for this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing now number two. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me.
Before the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing 393. 393. After we come together, after we sing and word that the Christians came together on the first day of the week to break bread. We know that Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. We're so thankful for that sacrifice that he made. We need to remember that because of his death, that perfect sacrifice, that he's now our mediator, our advocate with the Father, and he ever lives to make intercessions for us. Let's pray as we remember his death. Dear Father, we're so thankful for us this day and for all the blessings that you give us, especially we're thankful for the death of your son. We're thankful that he was willing to come to this earth, live a perfect life, shed his blood for us. We pray that you help us as we partake of this unleavened bread that we remember his body. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
missed anyone in the serving of the bread, if you'll raise your hand, we'll come back and serve you at this time. Would you bow once again, please? Father, again, we approach your precious throne of mercy, thanking you for this privilege, for this opportunity, for this responsibility that we have in honoring by this memorial the death of your Son and our dear Savior, Jesus. We pray that you would bless this fruit of the vine, which to us as penitent, baptized believers in your son, Jesus, symbolic of the precious blood that he shed for us, having no sins of his own, but the love that he had for us caused him to do that. For that, we thank you and pray that you would bless our partaking of this emblem. We thank you so much for this, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray to you. Amen. <clears throat> If we overlooked you, please let us know now and we'll serve you at this time. That completes the Lord's Supper at this time. We're going to take an opportunity to lay by in stores. We've been prospered. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for all the physical blessings that you give us in this life. Pray that you'd help us to realize that all these blessings come from you and they're yours. We're only stewards and people who are going to be held accountable for these things. Dear Father, we pray that you'd be with us as we purpose in our heart to give as we've been prospered. In Jesus' name, amen.
Number 219. 219, you'll need to use your book. Two one nine. Let's sing out. The Lord, my shepherd, is I shall be well supplied. Sends his mine and I am his. What can I want beside? What can I want beside? He leads me to the place where heavenly pasture grows, where living waters gently pass and full salvation flows. And full salvation flows. If I go astray, he doth my soul reclaim, and guides me his own right way, for his most holy name, for his most holy Our prayer this morning, number 149, 149. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Savior, so precious Thou'rt. Fold me, oh, fold me close to Thy breast. Shelter me safe in Thy
please bow with me. Our most gracious, kind, heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and each day you give us. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity to be here with other Christians. We're also thankful, Father, for each blessing you give us. Father, we ask that you be with us and be with this nation and each one that makes up a world that you have created. And let us know, Father, that when the time has come, by your hands only and your thoughts only will it end. We ask, Father, that you forgive us when we sin and be with us through our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 348 will serve as our song of encouragement this morning, 348. Please mark that. And before the lesson, we'll sing number 203. 203. <clears throat> Soldiers of Christ, arise. Let's stand and sing. Sing out, song before the lesson. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the love of us and in his mighty power. You may occur through Jesus trust. Who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endured. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every grace. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done, and all your conflicts past, you may your come through Christ alone. You may your come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. Be seated, please. Be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. We'll begin just a moment by reading a few verses out of that chapter, Acts chapter 16. It is good to see each of you here this morning. We do have visitors in our midst, and we are delighted that you have chosen to be with us in our worship service this morning. We have had a very busy last week with the gospel meeting that began last Sunday, continued through Thursday, and then we had a day off, and some didn't even have that day off because they had to do some work from the weekend or through the week to get ready for the weekend. We had uh, Brother Chester stayed in the house next door, and you know the more I say that phrase, the better I like it, the house next door. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, he stayed there, and then of course we had uh, speakers coming in for the weekend and the youth rally, and one of them, along with some who were traveling with him, stayed there on uh, Friday night, and so it's been a really busy time. We had an excellent gospel meeting, and we had an excellent youth rally yesterday. 
As already been mentioned, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 or so here. Uh, we had um, four wonderful lessons from the young men who were present with us, Chris uh, Clevenger from uh, uh, Ironiton and then uh, Justin Pascal from Demopolis, Alabama. And they just did a marvelous job presenting lessons on what was themed all stars of the Bible. I told Melanie yesterday, I said, you came up with a really good theme, and Johnny carried it out rather well. But it was a great day, and we appreciate Johnny and Melanie and the work that they did and others who helped make that uh, day yesterday a, a great success. I think one of the best, if not the best, youth rallies that we've had since I've been here. I thought it really went well. But I did mention uh, before services this morning to some that after the preaching that we heard last week and then the uh, four lessons that I heard yesterday, I'm almost embarrassed to get up here this morning. Uh, some great, great preaching has been done over the last few days here. If I were to ask you this morning, what would you consider some of the major questions that need to be asked and answered, what questions would you ask? If you're thinking about it from somewhat of a, an earthly or worldly standpoint, it might be that, especially for young people, they might be thinking, well, you know, what, uh, what college should I attend when I finish high school? Or what uh, should be my major when I do go to college? Or if I'm anticipating getting into the workforce, you know, what kind of a job should I be looking for? What, what kind of work should I try to do? in my life. If one is thinking about marriage, the question probably would arise, what am I looking for in a mate? And that, boy, that was discussed in a very severe way yesterday, in a very fine way. What kind of mate should uh, I be looking for in that regard? Or if you're thinking about marriage, one might even ask the question, is marriage becoming obsolete? And so on and on and on we could go with with various questions that, that are really important questions to one's life. But I want to discuss with you briefly this morning what I consider to be the most important question that one could ever ask. And unfortunately, as great as that question is, there are many who are answering it incorrectly. Read with me, if you will, beginning in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do? to be saved. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. What must I do to be saved? If you were to ask that question to the various peoples of this world, you would get a number of different answers. If you were to ask the atheist, for example, Sir, what must I do to be saved? The answer would come back, Absolutely nothing. Because to that man there is no God. 
And certainly the matter of salvation would not be an issue. No God, no heaven, no hell, no hereafter. He would say there is simply nothing that you must do because salvation is no issue at all. If you were to ask that question to the humanist, for example, Sir, what must I do to be saved? You would get basically the same response, nothing. Because to the humanist, there is no God. The mind of man is the only God there is. If you were to ask the universalist, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He would give you the very same answer, nothing. Because you see, to the universalist, everybody is going to be saved. Not one single person who has, does, or ever will live will be lost according to the thinking of these people. If you were to ask the Calvinist, Sir, what must I do to be saved? You would get the very same response. Nothing. Because in the mind of the Calvinist, we have the matter of election. That is, before the foundation of the world, according to them, God chose every individual who would be saved and consequently has chosen every other person to be lost. And according to their thinking, if you are among those who have been elected to salvation, there is nothing you can do to lose that. And if you were unfortunately among the number, who was chosen to be lost, there is absolutely nothing that you can do to change that situation. And so their answer would be the same, nothing. There's nothing you can do to change your situation. If you were to ask the moralist, Sir, what must I do to be saved? You would get a little bit different answer. Because that individual would say to you basically, you just need to good, live a good life. You just need to be a good neighbor. You don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, those kinds of things that, that we think of as so bad in the realm of sin. You just uh, don't do those things and, and everything will be all right relative to your salvation. If you were to ask an individual who might be classified as an emotionalist, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He would say to you, probably nothing. He would suggest to you that through some emotional, unusual, and he would probably say miraculous experience, something that may have happened to you out in the cornfield somewhere, through that process you were saved. You lost control. There was nothing you could do. God chose you at that point to save you. And consequently, there's nothing left to do. If you were to ask the religionist of the day, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He would simply say to you, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Just accept Him as your personal Savior and everything else will be in order. So you see, all of these people have different ideas. But if we were to take only this list and raise the question, which one of these answers is right, which would it be? Well, to the individual who has read and studied and understands the Word of God relative to this question, your answer would be not a single one of those is right. Every one of them has missed it. But they have given different answers. So when we think about that concept, what must I do to be saved? We recognize that that question implies that one is lost. And we know that to be the case. For in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul said, There is none righteous, no, not one. Then down in verse 23 of the same chapter, he said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Beginning the Roman letter, <coughs> Paul emphasizes in chapter 1 that the Gentile is lost. And he categorizes, categorizes them 
in that regard. Gentiles, they're lost. Then when he comes to chapter 2, he raises the question to the Jews. Why are you looking down on the Gentiles? You're in the same boat they're in. So he talks about the Gentiles in chapter 1. He talks about the Jews in chapter 2. And then concludes in chapter 3 by saying, All have sinned, both Jew and Gentile. So to raise that question, what must I do to be saved? We're talking about the fact that there is something to be done. We're talking about something that is imperative. We're not talking about optional matters here. We're talking about something that must be done. Raising the question, what must I do? That makes it individual, doesn't it? It's not a matter of what my father has done, not a matter of what my grandfather has done, but it's a matter of what I must do. That personal, individual responsibility. What must I do? Implies that there is something to be done, and we've talked about that in the recent past. But when we open our Bibles, and we begin to, to search the matter of what must I do to be saved, you will find that that basic question is asked three times in the New Testament. The first occasion would be in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching on Pentecost, and he reached a certain point when he said, Let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what? shall we do? They didn't have the part to be saved, but within the context which we recently discussed in that matter, the matter is of concern is the fact that they have crucified the Son of God. They have obviously, obviously been convinced and convicted of that and now desire to have forgiveness of their sins. What must we do? What shall we do? And they were told what to do. The other, another place is found in the reading that we read a moment ago. Acts chapter 16. When the jailer realized what had happened, springing in, confronting uh, uh, the apostle Paul, especially on that occasion, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he was told. The other occasion is found, and there's actually a, a dual reference here, Acts chapter 9. You'll recall that Paul was with others on his way to Damascus to persecute those who were of the persuasion of Christianity. We've already seen in the closing, well in chapter 7, closing part of chapter 7, that he was present, he was the one at whom those who stoned Stephen laid their coats. Then in chapter 8 we learn that he was making havoc of the church. He was persecuting those who were Christians. And now, in chapter 9, he is on his way to Damascus to continue that process, to persecute those who were Christians. But we'll remember that uh, there appeared to him on that occasion the Lord. Bright light shined round about him, and the voice from heaven spoke, and he heard, and he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He obviously realizes at that point that he is not doing what God wants done because the Lord said to him, you're kicking against the pricks and you can't do that. You're not going in the right direction. You're not doing what pleases God. So Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Those are the three occasions. Now, when you look at each of those questions and the answers given, you'll readily recognize that there, were, that there were differences in the answers given, at least to some degree. But that should not be unusual to us. When you realize that each of the, the cases under consideration, the individuals who were raising the question were in a different relationship, they were in a different distance, if you please, from God. You can often illustrate that by the concept of mileage. We just were told that some of our brethren are going to be traveling over to Circe next week, and in all probability, uh, they know how far it is. But if they didn't, and they begin their travels, and, and they, 
they stop over about Birmingham and they say, how far is it to Searcy? They'll get one answer. They travel on and they make it up to about Memphis and they stop and they ask the question, how far is it to Searcy? They're not going to get the same answer they got in Birmingham because they're now closer than they were. So you see the point. And so whenever you look at these three occasions, we don't have conflicting answers. We just simply have answers given to people who were in a different relationship, different stages of coming near to God. And because of that, different answers were given to them. So we want to, to look at that particular situation. And so you began, let's begin in Acts chapter 16, and that's the text that where we'll spend most of our time anyway. But here is a man who obviously was or had no clue relative to God. And you look at the background of this man. And as you read through the story, and he comes in and he, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31 he is told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now time will not permit us to deal with the, the background of this man. But suffice it to say, when he was told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, he probably thought within his mind, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that? See, he was coming out of a pagan background. And he would have had no clue. And it's, it's odd that so many people in the religious world, when they look at this particular story, want to stop at the end of verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thus their answer to us would be, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. And would tell us nothing more as if that were the only thing we had to do. But you'll notice in verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. <coughs> Why would they do that? Simply because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. They had just told him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't know what to believe at that point. He didn't know who the Lord Jesus was. And so they spake unto him the Word of the Lord, which obviously would have revealed to him who Jesus is. <clears throat> and so because of his distance in that regard from God, he needed to be told what to do. When they spake unto him the word of the Lord, it is obvious that he believed. Not only did he believe, <coughs> he repented of his sins. There was acts of repentance. You may recall when John was teaching and preaching uh, at the river Jordan and the Pharisees came to him. And he said, bring forth fruit. Meet to repentance. In other words, bring forth evidence that you have repented of your hypocritical ways. So when you continue reading this story, they spake in him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Would that not have been fruit of repentance? Would that not manifest that he is now sorry for what he's done in the past, sorry for what has happened to them, and he's doing whatever he can to make it better for them? And was baptized he and all his straight way. So he was taught what to believe. He believed it. He repented of his sins and was baptized in that regard. If time would permit, we could look at James chapter 2. And show very clearly that there was more to this man's salvation than just believing in the Lord Jesus. Three times in that chapter, James 2, James says in essence that faith without works is dead. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, he said. So there is more involved than just faith only. And so in Acts chapter 2, the case there, Peter had preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And what a marvelous presentation Brother Chester did on that in Thursday night's lesson of our gospel meeting. But he has preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He has emphasized that Christ 
was raised from the dead, that he has now been exalted to the right hand of God. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart. <clears throat> well, we're taught that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of John and Myra, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And so they were cut, pricked to the heart by the message that they had just heard. And they raised the question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter didn't tell those people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Paul did to the Philippian jailer. Why? It is evident that they already believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the fact that they had crucified Him and now were desiring forgiveness of their sins. So what did He tell them? He told them to repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's what he told them. That's what they needed to do in order to be forgiven of the sins that they had committed. Those who did what they were told to do were saved. You'll recall as uh, that story continues, with many other words, did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this, or, this untoward generation. And they that gladly received the word were baptized. There were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Then you read on down to verse 47, and you find that the Lord was continuing to add on a daily basis those who were being saved, those who were doing exactly what they were told to do relative to salvation. They were added to the church. And you know, the same thing will happen today. People who desire to be saved from their past sins, once they understand what the Bible teaches them to do, they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They will repent or turn away from their sins, and they will be baptized for the remission of sins. That's what these were told to do. That's what they did, and they were saved people. They were then added to the church. You don't join the church of Christ. You do exactly what God has said do in order to be forgiven of your sins and the Lord himself will add you to the church. Nobody's going to vote you in. Nobody's going to vote you out. The Lord will add those who are obedient to the first principles of the gospel. Then you think about that situation in, in Acts chapter 8, one that we have not mentioned. Here's a man from Ethiopia riding along in his chariot reading from Isaiah 53. Philip joined himself to that chariot, asked the man, do you understand what you, believe, what you read? And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And they came to certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip didn't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He obviously already believed that. Philip didn't say to him, you need to repent of your sins. He obviously was a man who was doing his best to live a sin-free life. But Philip said to him, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He made the confession that must be made as a prerequisite to being baptized into Christ. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, according to Romans chapter 10. So when you look at all of these cases, you find, when you put them together, what one must do in order to be saved. You see, this man in Acts chapter 8 was not told, you've already been saved, nor did he confess I've already been saved. This man wasn't told. There's nothing you can do to be saved, nor did he confess, I am a sinner. That's not the confession of the New Testament. The confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is the confession that must be made. But then you look at other situations, and these 
basically deal with people who've never been baptized into Christ. But you see that question, what must I do to be saved, is not a question that is to be asked only to those who have never been baptized into Christ. For example, what must I do to be saved if I am religiously, doctrinally wrong? We talked about that a little bit in the, in the Bible class this morning. But, uh, you know, sometimes people just are not taught the truth. And they do what they have been taught. They believe that they have done right, but have not. Acts chapter 19 is a good example of that. came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what then were ye baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been taught incorrectly. You know, oftentimes we encounter people who are not members of the body of Christ. And as we begin to talk to them about their salvation and the need to be baptized, they'll say, well, I've been baptized. And then for the most part, we don't know what to do with it after that. But here's a good example of some people who have been baptized, but they've been baptized incorrectly. They have been taught wrong, consequently baptized wrong. There are religious organizations who teach baptism. But they do not teach it for the forgiveness of sins. That is, in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins. They baptize as, as what they refer to as an outward sign of an inward act of salvation. That is, they baptize subsequent to one's salvation according to their teaching. That's not what the Bible teaches. And those who have been baptized in that way need to understand that that is not according to the teaching of the New Testament. I've even encountered people who would say, and, and you know, sometimes it's just hard to, to counteract what people believe, but they say, I've been baptized for the remission of sins. Then my question is, to what were you added when you were baptized? You see, I don't think we've done sufficient teaching on the purpose of baptism. It is for the forgiveness of sins, but it also enables one to be added to the Lord's church. These people, didn't under, they understood baptism, but they didn't understand things relative to the Holy Spirit. There are people who understand baptism for the remission of sins, but they do not understand baptism as it relates to their becoming members of the body of Christ. And so they were baptized in some religious organization, supposedly for the forgiveness of sins, having no clue what the body of Christ was. That baptism is not effective because it is without understanding of the very purpose of baptism itself. Thus, they would need to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins to be added to the body of Christ. What about the erring child of God? Is this question not applicable? What must I do in order to be saved? You see, salvation is a continuing process. In Acts 8, Simon, after he'd been baptized, obviously forgiven of his sins, was told to repent and pray that perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. He tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit with money. He erred in doing so. In James 5, 16, James says, Confess your faults one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What about the babe in Christ? Would that question not apply? What must I do to be saved? Well, you've just been baptized. Your sins have been forgiven. But what must you do in order to maintain that salvation? Well, Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Peter continues by saying, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What about those who are faithful in service to God as members of the body of Christ? Does this question apply? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Yes, it applies. What would the answer be? In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, 
Paul answers it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then Jesus' statement in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. My, what a far-reaching question. It reaches so far that it will, it will affect your eternal destiny. It will affect eternity. So every one of us in this audience this morning needs to think about this question. What must I do to be saved? If you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to confess that, turn away from your sins, you can be baptized. Every sin of the past is forgiven. Raised to walk as a child of God in newness of life. You're a child of God, but you haven't been faithful. You ask that question, well, what, what do I need to do? You need to repent of your sins, confess those sins, and ask God's forgiveness as per the verses we noted a moment ago. But you're a faithful child of God. You say, I've been baptized. I'm living as faithfully as I can, I can humanly live. What do I need to do? The answer is, keep doing what you're doing. Walk in the light as He is in the light. And you'll continue to have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse you from sin. But in the event that there's someone in this audience who needs to respond to your answer to that question, you need to be baptized into Christ. You need to ask God's forgiveness. And we can assist you in doing that. Let us do it as we stand together and sing this song. Jesus is tenderly calling the home. Calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam Father and farther away? Call tenderly calling today Jesus is waiting oh come to him now come today waiting today come with thy sins at his feet lowly bow come and no longer delay calling today call Jesus is pleading, go oh, listen to his voice, hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice, quickly arise and away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. We'll close this morning with number 15, verses 1 and 6 of Amazing Grace. We ask you to pass your cards to the center aisle to be picked up as we sing these two verses and invite you back for our evening worship at 6 p.m. CIA meeting at 4.30 and Pew Packers at 5.40 and then our evening worship. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years, 
bright shining as the sun we know less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun Will you bow with me please as we pray? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, as we come to Thee in prayer, dear Lord, we ask for Your humble forgiveness of, of the sins that are in our lives. We're so thankful, dear Father, for this avenue that You've allowed us to have to where we can come to Thee with our problems and our gratitude and our thankfulness for allowing us, dear Lord, to be a part of thy kingdom and thy work. We're thankful, dear Lord, for our health and well-being, and we're thankful, dear Lord, for allowing our members that were sick to be with us this morning. We pray for the ones that were mentioned this morning that are sick, that are having problems, dear Father. We ask that it be in thy will, dear Lord, that they be granted their health or a portion of their health, dear Father. Dear Lord, no matter how long we have our loved ones, we never want to turn them loose to Thee. And that's selfishness on our part, and we ask for Your forgiveness, dear Father. But sometimes when we're so close to our families, it's hard to say goodbye. We're thankful, dear Lord, for the message we've heard this morning. We're thankful for these songs, and we pray, dear Lord, that they have been acceptable to thee, dear Father, and that you are well pleased with what we have done this morning to try to, to have divine worship and to give you the honor and the glory which you so richly deserve. We ask, dear Father, now as we depart from this building, that each of us examine ourselves and know that each day we each have an opportunity to, to serve Thee in a manner that no one else can. We ask now, dear Father, if it be Thy will to continue to watch on, protect us, and forgive us when we fail You. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.